Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jeff Rumberg. I'm a managing partner with MetricNet, and I will be your host for today's webcast on desktop support key performance indicators. I want to welcome all of you and thank you for participating in our webcast today. Before I get started, I have just a few administrative announcements to make. During the presentation, all of you will be in listen-only mode. However, if you have any questions during the webcast, you can type them in the dialog box that appears in the lower right corner of your screen. I will pause once during the presentation to answer questions. Additionally, I will remain on the webcast at the conclusion of today's presentation to answer any final questions that you might have or that I did not get to during the first Q&A break. This webcast typically lasts about 90 minutes. So for those who have other commitments later in the day, I should be wrapped up by about 3.30 or so Eastern time in the United States. Now I see that quite a few of our existing clients have joined us on the webcast today, and I want to thank you for that. I also counted quite a few of our uh, on our webcast today that I met at the HDI conference last March. Uh, but for those who are not familiar with MetricNet, let me give you just a brief introduction. Our core business is benchmarking. We perform benchmarks for a variety of industries and functional areas. My role in the company is to manage the desktop support service desk, and call center benchmarks and assessments for MetricNet. Now, the work we do for IT service and support organizations worldwide spans the gambit, from benchmarking and idle assessments to consolidation studies and outsourcing analyses. Typically, the IT service and support groups that we, wor we work with are looking to optimize their performance, and we help them achieve that objective through benchmarking. Now, for those who have not been to our website yet, I would encourage you to go and take a look around at metricnet.com. One of the unique features of the website is that we offer a free membership that gives you unlimited access to all of our online content. This includes our metric of the month, our webcast recordings, white papers, and presentations. All you have to do is complete a short form and you will be enrolled as a free premium member. And then each time you visit our website thereafter, you can go directly to our resource library to access all of our online content absolutely free of charge. Now since the question of how to benchmark comes up in every webcast we conduct, I'll preempt the question right now and give you just a brief overview of MetricNet's benchmarking lineup. There are three ways that you can complete a benchmark with MetricNet. First, there are peer group benchmarks that compare your desktop support, call center, or service desk performance to that of a unique peer group. These are our custom benchmarks and they're very comprehensive in scope. Secondly, if you're only interested in industry benchmarking data, you can download an industry benchmarking report directly from our website. Let's go to metricnet.com, click the shop button on the upper navigation bar, and you'll see our industry benchmarks that are available for download. And finally, for those do-it-yourselfers, you can purchase a benchmarking data file in Excel format and conduct your own benchmarking analysis. Now, for those interested in a continuous improvement initiative, MetricNet recently launched its one-year path to world-class performance. This program starts with a benchmark and ROI calculation of your service and support organization. Following that is a six to nine month improvement phase. The program concludes with a second benchmark and ROI calculation approximately one year after the initial benchmark to objectively measure the progress that has been made and to prove definitively that your support organization has indeed achieved world-class performance. Now regardless of how or when you choose to benchmark your organization, I want to encourage all of you to connect with MetricNet on social media. We're active on all the major social media sites we put out a steady stream of posts, tweets, articles, discussions, and presentations that are designed to enrich the community of IT service and support professionals and to provide you with tools, insights, and information that you can use to enhance your professional careers. For those who'd like to follow us on Twitter during the webcast, use, ha use hashtag MetricNetLive to participate, share your thoughts, key points, questions, or just to follow along. And one final note before we get started, and this is particularly important for those who wish to receive a copy of today's presentation. When you exit the webcast, a brief survey will pop up on your screen. Please be aware that only those who complete the survey will receive a copy of the presentation. The survey provides us with valuable feedback on the webcast. It's only four questions long, and it takes about 15 seconds to complete. So if you do us a favor and answer that survey at the end of the webcast, I'd be very grateful, and in return for that courtesy, I'll send you a copy of today's presentation. Now let's go ahead and get started. Now I'm going to do something a little bit out of the ordinary for today's webcast. Uh, specifically, what I'm going to do is put our discussion of desktop support key performance indicators 
in the context of metric nets desktop support benchmarks from 2014. Now in this way, we're not only able to provide an overview and a deep dive on desktop support KPIs, but we're able to share with you some recent metric net benchmarking results for desktop support. Now over the years, MetricNet has completed literally thousands of benchmarks for service desk and desktop support organizations worldwide. One of the advantages of doing that many benchmarks is that we have built up the most comprehensive database of IT service and support metrics in the industry. This data gives us a lot of insight into the key success factors of the industry's top performing support organizations. So it's worth pointing out right up front that everything you see and hear today is empirical in nature. There's nothing hypothetical, academic, or theoretical about what I'm about to present today, simply based upon what we have observed in the industry, having completed literally thousands of IT service and support benchmarks over the years. Now in 2014, there were nearly 140 separate organizations that participated in MetricNet's desktop support benchmark. These organizations were from 31 different countries. So when I talk about a data record, I'm referring to a distinct and discrete desktop support organization. You can see the countries represented all from North America. We've got Mexico, the US, and Canada from North America. We've got several Latin American countries that participated. We've got quite a few from Asia, both developing countries, such as Australia and Japan, as well as developing countries, such as Malaysia and India. We have numerous countries in Europe that participated and several from the Middle East. So this truly was a global benchmark and the results that I'm going to be sharing with you are global in nature. So again, 138 separate desktop support organizations. There were slightly more than 100 companies. Because some companies had two or even three desktop support groups participate in this benchmark. But they're from 31 countries, so this truly does represent a global benchmark. Now, most of you are probably familiar with how benchmarking works, but for those who may not be familiar or who might need a, a quick refresher, let me just define benchmarking very quickly so that we're all on the same page. And as I go through these benchmarking results, everybody understands how the benchmarking process and methodology worked. We start with a comparison of your service desk or desktop support organization relative to a benchmarking peer group. Now that comparison by itself might be interesting. We might look at, for example, cost per ticket, customer satisfaction, mean time to resolve, but the comparison by itself is not very meaningful unless it comes along with a diagnostic. So the second and more important piece of benchmarking is this. When you identify a performance gap between your own desktop support organization and that of the benchmarking peer group, let's say, for example, that your customer satisfaction is below average or your mean time to resolve is above average, or your cost per ticket is above average. You need to understand why those gaps exist because it's only by understanding how those gaps exist or why they exist that you can do something about them. Benchmarking enables you to selectively adopt and adapt the industry's best demonstrated practices from within your benchmarking peer group to ultimately build a sustainable competitive advantage in IT service and support. Now given enough time, any service and support organization can achieve world-class performance. The question is, how long is it going to take you? Months or years? I would submit that benchmarking enables you to bypass all the incrementalism associated with most improvement initiatives and achieve world-class performance not at an evolutionary pace, but rather at a revolutionary pace. You see, most improvement efforts are incremental in nature because they're based on trial and error. But what benchmarking says is that you don't have to improve through trial and error. The industry's proven best practices are pretty well documented at this point, and by building upon, implementing, and then progressively improving upon those industry best practices, you can, in fact, achieve world-class performance in a relatively short period of time, and that's the real power of benchmarking. Now, what, another way of describing the advantages of benchmarking is on this chart on page 10. We're showing a two-dimensional chart where we have cost per ticket on the x-axis. This is the measure of efficiency. And on the y-axis, we have quality as measured by customer satisfaction. Now, the blue dots or the blue circles on this chart are representative data from our benchmark from last year. And as you can see, there's clearly a correlation between cost and quality of service. Moreover, it is a cause and effect relationship, meaning that cost typically is what drives your quality. Another way of stating this is that generally in service and support, you'll know this if you've worked in service and support for any period of time at all, Typically, you negotiate around 
budgetary constraints. You negotiate for headcount, you negotiate for spending power, and then you go out and you achieve the best level of performance that you possibly can with those limited resources. Very rarely is the discussion around quality and then you're given the budget necessary to achieve some customer satisfaction level or mean time to resolve or cost per ticket. Typically, the discussion is around budget and then you're left with limited resources, which every organization is constrained by. You're left with limited resources to deliver the best possible support you possibly can. Now, if we look at this data, there are several things that we can observe about it. The first is that, as I mentioned, there's clearly a correlation. Moreover, it is a cause and effect relationship, but it's not a linear relationship. You can see that as quality increases, cost increases disproportionately. This is just diminishing returns, which you probably learned about in economics, and it's true of almost any product or service, whether you're buying a seat on an airplane, for example, a coach class seat going across the country might only be four or $500, whereas the first class seat going across the country might be $2,000. Likewise for cars or homes or anything else you might purchase, there is a relationship between cost and quality, but it typically is not linear. Uh, there generally are diminishing returns associated with increase in quality. Now there are several implications of that. One implication is that you probably don't want to try for zero defects or 100% customer satisfaction because it would simply be too expensive. However, if you have purchased too much quality, that is if you've over-invested in service and support, you have an opportunity to reduce your cost pretty dramatically without impacting quality very much because you're out here on the flat end of the curve. By contrast, if you're down here in the lower left and you're not spending very much in service and support, you can oftentimes improve your quality pretty dramatically without increasing your costs very much. And this is why most organizations tend to end up at this sort of midpoint, for those of you who remember calculus and differential calculus, if you were to take the derivative of this curve right at that point, uh, the derivative would be one, which says that uh, the slope at that particular point is about 45 degrees. Another way of saying that is that you've struck sort of an even balance between the trade-off or the trade-off between cost of delivering service and the quality of service. But the real point of this chart is to illustrate that benchmarking is designed to move the needle on the two most important dimensions in service and support. Those dimensions are cost and quality as measured by customer satisfaction. What benchmarking does is it takes the inefficiency out of a service and support organization. It helps you identify costs that can potentially be eliminated and at the same time identify improvements for improved quality. So if you start at the beginning of a benchmark down at this sort of what we would call an average level of performance, a good benchmark is going to help you understand how you can optimize the delivery of service in your desktop support or your service desk. Move to the left, that is take out inefficiency, and then move up, that is improve the quality of service that you deliver. That's the real power and the goal of benchmarking. Now I do have a couple of questions for all of you regarding benchmarking, and I'm going to open up our first poll of the day, and as you can imagine, that poll has to do with benchmarking, and the poll is this, or the question is this, have you benchmarked your desktop support within the past year? And while you're answering that question, I just want to shout out to a handful of you. We've got uh, several hundred people on today's webcast, and you're from pretty much every time zone on the planet. We've got people from Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Malaysia, India, Hungary, Romania, uh, the UK, most of the big countries in Western Europe, uh, the United States, Canada, most of the Latin American countries. Uh, so we've got virtually every time zone represented here today. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, just a shout out here to a few names. I'm just picking these uh, at random. John Schmidt, thanks for joining us here today. Laura Flores, glad you could join us here today. Robert Cahill, good to have you here today. Vince Gonzalez, thanks for joining us. Okay, if you haven't weighed in on this polling question, please do so. Uh, have you benchmarked your desktop support within the past year? Let me go ahead and uh, share those results with you. And here are the results. 23% of you have benchmarked your desktop support within the past year. Another 66% of you have not. And then 11% of you not applicable. Now there's a follow-on question, uh, which I'm going to ask. And the follow-on question is, if I can get my uh, polling box back here. Do you plan to benchmark desktop support in the future? And you've got five choices here. The first one would be yes within the next 90 days, uh, yes within the next six months, uh, yes within the next year, 
no plans to benchmark at this time, and then not applicable if you're not affiliated with a desktop support organization, for example, if you're a consultant or you're uh, an outsourcer and you don't actually own or work in uh, desktop support. So while you're filling that out, I'll just do a few more shout outs here. Just um, we uh, uh, just want to uh, recognize the fact that many of you uh, are taking times out of your busy schedule to participate in MetricNet's bench, bench, uh, best practices presentation. And also many of you are calling in from time zones that are 12 time zones removed from MetricNet in Washington, DC. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, Bob Duty, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Chad Karkos, great to have you here today. Glad you could join us. Uh, Eva Viviano, good to see you here. Uh, Kimberly Sales, thanks for joining us. And I'm just calling these names out at random. Just want to uh, thank all of you for joining us today. Troy Sheets, thanks for joining us. Okay, looks like most of you have voted on this. Let me go ahead and close that poll and share the results with you. Okay, 11% of you are planning to benchmark your desktop support within the next 90 days. Another 14% are planning to benchmark within the next six months. 35%, slightly more than a third, are planning to benchmark within the next year. And currently, 24% of you have no plans to benchmark at this time. For those of you who are planning to benchmark within the next year, um, which is, let's see, 25 plus 35, about 60% of you, yes, within the next 90 days, yes, within the next six months, and yes, within the next year, I want to encourage you to move forward with those plans. I think one of the things you'll find as you get into benchmarking is that it's perhaps one of the best investments you can make in a service and support organization. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. It doesn't have, have to cost a lot of money, but it is the quickest path to world-class performance that we've been able to identify in this industry. Moreover, there is roughly a one-to-one -one correspondence between the best performers in this benchmark that I'm going to be sharing with you momentarily and those organizations that are benchmarking on an annual basis. So those that benchmark annually have achieved world-class performance by and large, unless there's an annual benchmark going on, it, it becomes more difficult to do that. So again, that empirical data says that those organizations that have adopted benchmarking and do it annually are the ones that performed best in our benchmark. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close that poll down. We're going to continue on with our discussion of the results of the global 2014 MetricNet desktop support benchmark. Now. The metrics that are included in the benchmark are shown on this particular page. There are 28 different KPIs organized into seven categories. We've got cost metrics, service level metrics, productivity, quality, ticket handling, technician metrics, and workload metrics. Now beneath each of those, you actually see the KPIs that we used in the benchmark, cost per ticket, cost per incident, cost per service request. And I will define for you momentarily the difference between an incident and a service request. We've got several service level metrics such as the average incident response time and the percentage of incidents resolved within one business day. We've got a number of productivity metrics. These are important because they drive cost. We've got several quality metrics including customer satisfaction, the big one or the most important one, several ticket handling metrics, technician metrics, and workload metrics. 28 metrics on this page. Now, we were asked by several companies that participated in this benchmark why we look at so many different KPIs, why can't we just look at two or three or four key performance indicators? And the answer is pretty simple. When we identify a performance gap in an organization, let's say that their cost per ticket is higher than the peer group average, or their customer satisfaction is below the peer group average, or the mean time to resolve is longer than the peer group average, we need to be able to diagnose why that gap exists. And it's only by hit having access to the underlying drivers or the underlying KPIs that drive those metrics that we can explain why a gap exists. Let me give you an example. On cost per ticket, there are several things that might drive a cost gap there. One of them could simply be the salaries of the agents that work in desktop support. If your salaries are higher than average, that could drive a higher cost per ticket. The reason is that this is a labor intensive function and the vast majority of your costs are tied up in your human resources. Not only your technician salaries and benefits, but also the salaries and benefits of the indirect personnel. These would include your supervisors, your team leads, your workforce schedulers, your trainers, your QA, QC uh, professionals, et cetera. So understanding salaries can help us diagnose a cost gap if there is one. Also looking at productivity metrics such as utilization. If, you're, if you have too much headcount, your utilization is going to be low and your cost per ticket is going to be high. Also, interestingly enough, a lot of people don't realize that absenteeism can drive costs pretty significantly. Think of absenteeism as the percentage by which your desktop support organization needs to be overstaffed in order to handle the workload. If you've got a two or three or four percent absenteeism rate, that's fairly low, but you're still overstaffed by two, three, or four percent in order to manage the workload. 
By contrast, if your absenteeism rate is 15, 20, or even more percent, uh, that's pretty significant. Uh, if you're at 15% absenteeism, which some organizations in this benchmark were, that means you have to be overstaffed by 15% in order to manage the workload. And so you're incurring a significant additional cost when your absenteeism uh, is high. Lastly, we also look at the ratio of technicians to total headcount in desktop support. That number averages around 80 plus percent. If the number is too low, what it says is that you're probably top heavy, meaning that you've got too many indirect personnel, you have too many chiefs and not enough Indians, you've got too many supervisors, team leads, workforce schedulers, QA, QC people, trainers, and the like. And uh, we like to see that ratio somewhere in the range of 75 to 85 percent. If that number is too low, that can drive a high cost per ticket as well. My point is that if we're going to be able to diagnose a gap in any one of the key performance indicators that you see on this page, we need a set of underlying drivers for that specific KPI so that we can identify and ascertain what drives that performance gap and hence advise our clients on what they can do to reduce their cost per ticket or increase their customer satisfaction or reduce their mean time to resolve. Now, I want to make a distinction uh, between incidents and service requests, um, and this is fairly standard vernacular in the industry, although not every organization defines an incident and a service request in exactly the same way that I've shown here. An incident generally is unplanned work that requires a physical touch to a device or a desk side visit to a user. It might be a hardware brake fix, could be a device failure, could be a connectivity failure, but it's generally unplanned work and it does require a site visit either to the device or the user. Service request, by contrast, is generally planned work. There are a few exceptions to this, but typically service requests are planned. For example, a physical move ad change, a hardware or software upgrade, a device refresh, a device setup, those are fairly typical service requests. Now, a ticket can be one or the other. It is either an incident or it is a service request. And so if you add those together, all of your incidents plus all of your service requests, you have your ticket volume. So your ticket volume tells you something about your workload, but it doesn't tell you everything about your workload. You really need to know what the breakdown is between incidents and service requests, and you need to know what your work time and your travel time is per incident and service request. I'll have more to say about work time and travel time as we get further into our discussion here. But I also want to point out that the results I'm about to share with you for our global 2014 desktop support benchmark were organized into three categories. We had a high density group, we had a medium density group, and we had a field services or a low density group. Let me explain what I mean by that. For a desktop support ticket, if it's truly desktop support, meaning that you have to go to the site of the user or the device, if you're in a high density end user environment, you can get very quickly from ticket to ticket. Uh, this would be a high-rise building as an example. Let's say you have five desktop support technicians supporting 2,500 people that work in a high-rise building, just as an example. Uh, it's not unusual to be able to get to and from the site of a ticket in 10 minutes or less. In fact, for the benchmark that I'm about to show you, I believe that was about the average, was about 10 minutes of travel time per ticket. By contrast, medium density environment would be, for example, a college campus or a large corporate campus where the travel times often run 25, 30, maybe 35 minutes per ticket. Uh, and then a field services environment is typically a regionally widespread organization. Uh, think large military installations such as Camp Pendleton in Southern California where desktop support technicians are only able to handle about one ticket per day because the travel times are so extensive. And typically it involves getting into a vehicle to drive to the site of the device or the user, run the troubleshoot, do the fix, do the fulfill the service request, and then go back to wherever base of operations is. So it's not unusual in a field services environment for individual technicians to only handle 20 to 30 tickets a month. Medium density environments are usually about twice that number of tickets monthly, and then the high density environment is even higher than that. But one of the significant differences between level one support, which is often referred to as the service desk, and level two or desktop support is that you have travel time associated with the ticket for level two or desktop support, whereas you do not have travel time associated with the ticket for level one support or the service desk, which is why shift left, that is moving a ticket from level two to level one support, is such an economically valuable thing to do if you possibly can. If you can resolve a ticket remotely 
using Bomgar or GoToAssist or LogMeIn, or if you can do it remotely simply because you have a good K-based knowledge-centered uh, service desk, or simply because your uh, agents or technicians are well experienced and well trained, uh, then that's a good thing. You can actually reduce your total cost of ownership. But for the sake of today's presentation, when we're talking about the results of this global desktop support benchmark, we did organize them into the three categories of high density, meaning low, low travel time per ticket, medium density, which is moderate travel time per ticket, and field services are low density, which is very high travel time per ticket. Now on this and the next four, three or four pages, I'm going to share some data with you. And these are very data-rich slides. I don't expect you to be able to absorb these in the short you know, 10, 15, 20 seconds that I show each one of these pages. But I do want to make you aware of the fact that this data is included in the presentation. And once again, you will receive a PDF copy of today's presentation just by filling out the survey at the end of today's webcast. Now, what I've got here for the high density environment are the 28 different key performance indicators listed in the second column from the left. The seven different types of KPIs are listed in the first column. And then for the companies that were in the high density group, we have some statistics. We show you what the average was for each of the 28 KPIs. The minimum, meaning the low value, it doesn't necessarily mean good or bad. On something like cost per ticket, a low value is a good thing. But on something like customer satisfaction, a low value is not a good thing. So minimum simply means the arithmetic minimum among the peer group. The maximum is the arithmetic maximum in the peer group. And the median is the midpoint of the data, meaning half the data points are above and half the data points are below. Now, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this chart other than to say that cost per ticket and customer satisfaction are the two most important metrics. And that will be a theme that you hear throughout today's webcast. Cost is a measure of efficiency. Customer satisfaction is a measure of effectiveness. And they are in constant tension. That's not only a necessary thing, it is a good thing because it forces you to prioritize. It forces you to make intelligent trade-offs between cost and quality and thereby find the point of minimum tension between the cost of service delivery and the quality of the customer experience. So this particular page summarizes for the 28 different KPIs, four statistics for the high density group. The next page has the same data for the medium density group. And rest assured, in a few minutes, I'm going to extract a few of these metrics, and we're going to drill down on them. And I'm going to explain why some of these metrics, like cost per ticket, do change quite a bit for the different densities, whereas other metrics are unaffected by the density of the end user environment. And thirdly, we have the data summary for field services. Lastly, what I did is I put all together, high density, medium density, and field services in a single chart. These represent averages for the three different groups. Again, 138 desktop support organizations organized into three categories, high density, medium density, field services. Lucky for us, we had approximately the same number of organizations, roughly 45 in each one of these categories, give or take a few. So the, the companies that participated in this benchmark were pretty evenly distributed in terms of the density of their end user populations. Now here's where I want to drill down on some of these metrics and talk about why some KPIs differ by density and other KPIs do not. If we start with cost per ticket, in a high density environment for this particular peer group, the cost per ticket is about $84 medium density environment, it's about $125 a ticket. And in a field services environment, meaning the lowest density, you've got about $250 per ticket. Now, the primary reason why can be seen in the second metric. If you look at the average travel time per ticket, it's about 10 minutes in a high density environment. That is to and from the side of the user or the device. We've got about 38 minutes of travel time in the medium density environment. And we've got about 100 minutes, more than an hour and a half of travel time in the field services environment. So the travel time differs quite a bit for the different density environments, and hence your cost per ticket varies quite a bit, simply because you have so much travel time associated with the lower density environments than you do the higher density environments. But look at the work time. Now keep in mind, work time is different than mean time to resolve. If I open a ticket at noon and close it at 4 p.m., the MTTR is four hours. However, if a technician only worked on that ticket for 10 minutes, their work time is going to be 10 minutes. So the mean time to resolve represents the total cycle time that the ticket is open, closed time minus open time. The work time is the actual time spent working on the ticket. You can see that the number doesn't vary a whole lot for the different environments. In a high density environment, it was 24 minutes. It was 21 minutes in the medium density and just under 20 minutes in the field services environment. Those numbers are fairly close. You can see that the density of the environment did not have a huge impact 
on the work time, the incident work time. If we look at service request work time, typically service requests require more work time than incidents do. Once again, we have a pretty close grouping of data, 46 minutes in a high density environment, 45 minutes in a medium density, and 45 minutes in a field services environment. So you can see that the work times per ticket don't vary much at all. The travel time tickets, however, do vary quite a bit, and that drives up the cost in the lower density environments, particularly for field services. Customer satisfaction ranged from a low of 81.4% to a high of 85.1. Average, again, these are not the ranges. I'll show you. The ranges actually appear on the, on the charts back here. So if we want to look at, in a field services environment, customer satisfaction ranged from a low of 48% to a high of 98%. What I'm showing you on this page are just the averages. The averages range from 81.4% to a high of 85.1%. You look at the number of tickets a technician can handle in a month, of course it's going to vary by density of the environment. If you're in a high density environment, you're getting to and from the side of the user or the device fairly quickly, and on average the technicians were handling about 143 tickets a month. In a medium density environment, they're handling about 88 tickets a month, and in a field services or low density environment, they're handling about 47 tickets per month. So uh, once again, because travel time differs so much by the density, your number of tickets handled per technician per month is also going to vary quite a bit. Now utilization does not vary a whole lot. The high utilization was about 58%, the low utilization was about 55%. This is the work time divided, work time plus travel time divided by the available work minutes per month. In case you've ever wondered, there's about 9,800 available work minutes per month. If you're working you know, 5,300 or 5,400 of those work minutes, your utilization is going to be right around 54 or 55%. We don't back out vacation days, sick days, administrative time, training time, or anything like that. We measure everyone worldwide in exactly the same way. That way we can intercompare technician utilization without having to worry about the differences in things like vacation time, sick leave, holidays, and the like. We look at the mean time to resolve incidents in a high density environment, it's about six and a half business hours, it's about 10 business hours in a medium density environment, and it's about 14 business hours in a field services environment. Mean time to fulfill a service request in business days, 2.9 days in a high density environment, five days for medium density, and 7.3 days in a field services environment. Now here's an interesting metric which will come up a couple of times during our presentation today, percent resolved level one capable. Let's imagine that you handle 1,000 desktop support tickets per month, and at the end of the month, you have some way of determining that 200 of those tickets could and should have been resolved at level one. That would give you a 20% re percent resolved level one capable. What this says is, of all the tickets you handled during the month, 20% of those, or 20.2%, could have and should have been resolved at level one. Why is this important? Well, because the average cost of resolving a ticket in desktop support ranges from $84 to $249, whereas the average cost of ticket resolved being resolved at level one is only about $22. So these represent costly defects. Anytime a ticket is pushed from level one support to desktop support, the cost of resolution increases fairly dramatically. And it's important to know this number because these, um, these tickets, like I said, they're defects, they do cost you money, and they increase your total cost of ownership pretty substantially. Finally, if we look at the number of tickets generated per seat per month, uh, it's about the same for all three environments. It doesn't matter if you're in a high density medium or field services environment. Um, they're generating about a half a ticket per month, which says that on average for an end user, every other month they're opening up one desktop support ticket. These numbers vary pretty dramatically though. If we go back here and we just pick out the high density environment, we can see that the number of tickets per seat per month varies from a low of 0 0.20 to a high of more than one ticket per seat per month, and it's the same for the uh, others as well. If we look at the field services environment, 0.21 tickets per end user per month uh, at the low end and 1.19 tickets per end user per month at the high end. Now one thing you should know is that you can never size your headcount or determine an appropriate headcount in desktop support based upon end user headcount alone. You know, I get a call at least once a week from a client or a prospective client who wants to know how many desktop support techs do I have? I've got 2,200 end users, tell me how many techs I need. Well, that depends. It depends on whether you're in a high density, medium density, or field services environment. It depends upon how often you refresh your technology. It depends upon how well trained your end users are. It depends upon how virtualized you are. It depends on a host of factors. So this myth, this idea that 
there's some magical ratio that says you need one desktop tech for every 200 end users or one desktop tech for every 1,000 end users. It's just that. It's a myth. It doesn't exist. Figuring out the appropriate headcount, and we do have a white paper on our website if you're interested in going to our website and downloading it. We have a white paper on our website that talks about how to staff desktop support. You staff based on workload, not end user population. And two different end user populations can produce dramatically different workloads. We've seen that on some of these prior pages here. In one environment, this uh, organization, 0.21 tickets per end user per month. In this organization, 1.2 two tickets or 1.16 tickets per end user per month. That's a vastly different workload and hence you're going to have a very different ratio of technicians to end user headcount in this environment than you would in this environment. So there is no magical ratio of technicians to end user headcount. You have to look at the workload that's generated. You have to understand the travel time associated with the ticket. And only then can you start to come up with a reasonable estimate of the appropriate technician headcount that you're going to need. Now, the obvious question that all these companies had in this benchmark was, well, gee, with all these KPIs, 28 different key performance indicators, um, how are we performing? I mean, I can look at my cost, and I can look at my customer satisfaction, I can look at my mean time to resolve, but what does it all mean? Well, the balanced scorecard answers that question for you. And in this scorecard, we include eight performance indicators, eight KPIs that we believe to be the most important in desktop support. You can see what they are. They're cost per incident and cost per service request. Those are our two uh, efficiency metrics. And then we have tech, uh, customer satisfaction. We have technician utilization. We have first call or first contact resolution rate for incidents. That is, you resolve it on the first contact with the device or the user. We have the percentage of incidents resolved in 24 hours. We have the mean time to complete service requests in days. And then we have technician job satisfaction. And I'll explain in a few minutes why that metric is important. But you can see that we weighted each one of the eight KPIs in this balanced scorecard. We overweighted cost and customer satisfaction because those are the foundation metrics. Everything you do in service and support boils down to one of two things. You're trying to contain your costs or you are trying to drive a higher quality customer experience. Those are the only two things that matter. I know that sounds very draconian, but viewed through that lens, it greatly simplifies management decision making in service and support because everything you do, every decision you make around headcount or technology or training or anything else has got to, in the long run, have one of two effects. You either contain your costs or reduce your costs, or you improve the quality of the customer interaction, or both. If it doesn't have one or both of those two effects, i.e. contain or reduce costs, or improve the quality of the customer interaction, it's measured by customer satisfaction, it isn't worth doing. It's as simple as that. And so those are the two most important metrics. We've overweighted cost. It gets 30% of the total weight. Customer satisfaction gets 25% of the total weight. But then for this particular benchmark, what we do is we show the worst performer in the benchmark for each one of the eight key performance indicators in the third column from the left. Fourth column from the left, we show the best performance for each of the eight KPIs in the uh, scorecard. Then what you would do is put your own performance in the third column from the right. We created a scorecard for each one of the 138 desktop support organizations that participated in this benchmark. This is just sample data that we put in here. It's actually averages for the peer group. You can see that you put your actual performance in the third column from the right, and then you calculate a metric score using this interpolation formula, which is worst case, that is you take the worst performer in the peer group and you subtract your actual performance. That becomes the numerator of the ratio. The denominator of the ratio is the range, which is the worst case minus the best case. And you come up with a metric score that ranges between 0 and 100%. If you have a high score, as this, uh, we have here in this example, 90%, it means you are much closer to the best end of the spectrum than you are to the worst end of the spectrum. At $48 per incident, it's much closer to $19 than it is to $312. So you get a very high score there when you run this interpolation formula. If you get a lower score, and the lowest score here is in technician utilization at 47.9%, the reason it is below 50% is because the actual utilization at 59% is much closer to the worst end of the spectrum, 36%, than it is to the high end of the spectrum. So this metric score shows you how far along the path you are from the worst case to the best case. That's why they call it a linear interpolation. Finally, when you multiply the metric score by the metric weighting, you come up with a balanced score for each one of the eight metrics in the scorecard. You add all those up and you come up with one number. Well, what does that number mean? Well, it turns out when we run literally hundreds or thousands of desktop support organizations 
through this algorithm, we get a nice bell-shaped curve. We get a nice normal distribution centered right above 50%, with tails running off to the right above 70%, tails running off to the left below 30%. Typically, if you're above 60%, you're going to be in the top quartile. If you're between 50 and 60%, you're going to be in the second quartile. If you're between 30, or excuse me, 40 and 50%, you're likely to be in the third quartile and below 40%. Typically, you're going to be in the fourth quartile for overall performance. So this score, 67.1%, is actually quite good. And when we look at it compared to the other desktop support groups in this benchmark, you can see here's the 67.1 we just calculated in the balanced scorecard. The orange bar here represents that score, 67.1%. The average for this peer group was 52%. The high score was 86.2. That's this data point over here. The low score was 16%. That's this data point down over here in the lower right. So this score, 67.1%, turns out to be pretty good because the average was only 51.9% for this benchmarking peer group. And as I mentioned earlier, generally the average is right around 50% when we run hundreds of desktop support organizations through this algorithm. So think about what we've done. We've taken a set of disparate metrics, some with units of dollars, some with units of percent, some with units of days, and we've aggregated them, rolled them together, and normalized them to create this overall measure of performance that ranges from zero to 100%. This enables you to compare on a fair apples-to-apples -apples basis, level playing field, how your desktop support performance compares to others in your benchmarking peer group, and it also gives you a mechanism whereby you can track your performance over time. The blue bars on this particular chart represent uh, real data from a client of Metric Nets from uh, two years ago. They, uh, they implemented the balanced scorecard. They updated it on a monthly basis, and you can see that they didn't go up every single month. There were some ups and downs, but on balance, their score was improving. The purple background here represents the trailing 12-month average. So the balanced scorecard does a lot of things for you. It allows you to compare yourself fairly to other desktop support organizations, but it also enables you to track and trend your overall performance versus time. There's no other metric that does that for you. And particularly for a layperson who does not have a real deep understanding of desktop support or service desk operations, uh, as soon as you start talking about different KPIs like cost per ticket, travel time per ticket, customer satisfaction, etc., uh, they're going to lose sight of the bigger picture, and they're not going to know what your overall performance is when you start throwing all those KPIs at them. So the balanced scorecard really resolves that dilemma by giving you a single overall measure of performance, a fair way to compare yourself to other desktop support organizations, and it's a great way to track and trend your performance over time. I'm going to shift gears now. So far, we've been talking about the quantitative results of this global benchmark, 138 companies. I want to share with you now some of the more empirical observations or some of the less quantifiable results that came out of this benchmark. I think you'll find these just as fascinating as the quantifiable results that I've just been through. And as I continue through the second half of this presentation, uh, we are going to continue our discussion of key performance indicators in the context of the result of a global benchmark. The first thing I want to talk about here, and uh, we, we extracted what we consider to be the 10 most important uh, indicators or observations or best practices that we identified from those that perform the best. We took the top performers, the top quartile in this benchmark, and we extracted from that what we felt were the 10 most important success factors. What did they have in common? These are the 10 things we came up with. Starting with this one, performance measurement and management is a holistic discipline. Let me explain what I mean by that. Most of you are probably familiar with this paradigm, people, process, and technology, or you have at least heard that before. And the idea is that you invest first in your people. You recruit effectively, you train them, you invest in them, and then you build processes around them that enable them to work effectively. These are presumably processes that are compliant or consistent and operate within an idle framework and are consistent with IT service management. And then you have technology built on top of that. The technology is there to automate processes, to reduce cycle time, to reduce errors within the organization, and to improve the overall effectiveness of service and support. Now, most people buy into this idea. You put the people first, you build the processes around them, and then you invest in technology last. But I would submit to you, and this is somewhat heresy, I realize that in the industry, that there's an even more fundamental building block to this, and that building block is metrics, specifically key performance indicators and the discipline of performance measurement and management. Now, this isn't just me speculating. It's not me making it up simply because the name of my company is MetricNet. There's real data that backs this up. 
when we look at, in this particular case, there's 143 data points or five organizations that got their desktop results to us late in 2015 as opposed to 2014. So we've got a few more data points than the 138 that are in most of the charts that I'm showing you. But on this particular page, we've got blue diamonds that represent data points. We've got a red line that represents linear regression through the data. On the y-axis, we're showing the balanced score for each of these 143 desktop support organizations. Remember how we calculated the balanced score? So we have the balanced scores listed on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we measured the maturity of their key performance indicator or their metrics discipline. We have a proprietary scale, goes from one to five, very similar to the CMM model, capability maturity model. One is the least mature, five is the most mature. And as you can see here, as the maturity of the metrics within an organization improves, so too does the balance score improve. That's why the linear regression goes up and to the right. And you can see that when you look at this set of data, the blue diamonds uh, tend to move as a group up and to the right. Now, a level one maturity would be an organization that has almost no key performance indicators, and they do almost nothing with their KPIs. In other words, they track a couple metrics, but they don't do anything with them. By contrast, a uh, level five in terms of their metrics maturity would be an organization that not only has a complete set of key performance indicators, but they use them diagnostically. They use them uh, prescriptively, that is to develop action plans for improving their performance, and then they actually do something with that action plan, meaning they act on it. Um, so uh, they go way beyond just tracking and trending their performance. They use KPIs diagnostically and prescriptively, and they actually do something with those KPIs, which enables them to improve their performance over time. Now, historically, what we've seen in this industry, not just for desktop support, but for level one support as well, is that there's an overabundance of measurement, lots and lots of KPIs, but not much analysis was being done historically. And as a result, there was very little action planning happening and even less action. But as you can see from the red arrow, the value increases as you move up this pyramid. The analysis you do with your key performance indicators has more value than the KPIs themselves. The action planning is even more valuable, and the action itself is the most valuable thing at all, of all. So what has happened in the last three to five years is that this paradigm's been turned upside down, and we have now what is called the holistic approach to performance measurement and management that de-emphasizes the key performance indicators, but it emphasizes the analysis of those KPIs, the action planning based on those KPIs, and ultimately the emphasis em impetus and the emphasis here is on taking action because KPIs are worthless unless you're willing to act on them, unless they inform intelligent management decisions that enable you to improve your performance over time. So this is the holistic approach to performance measurement and management. Now, as you can imagine, when you look at this, an emphasis on measurement, the historical approach, a de-emphasis on measurement, the holistic approach, and that leads us to the 80-20 rule for desktop support key performance indicators. In other words, less is more when it comes to desktop support KPIs. The same is true when it comes to service desk KPIs. Less really is more. And the metrics that really matter here are your cost per ticket and your customer satisfaction. We refer to these as the foundation metrics. Cost is your measure of efficiency. Customer satisfaction is your measure of effectiveness. Those two are in constant tension. That's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing, as I mentioned earlier, because it forces you to make choices about how you're going to prioritize the things that you do in, in service and support. Now, underlying those are their drivers. The technician utilization is what drives your cost per ticket because this is a labor-intensive function, and any serious effort to contain costs has to look at human resource productivity. We also look at first contact resolution rate and mean time to resolve, which are the two big drivers of customer satisfaction. And we've got a TCO, a total cost of ownership metric here, the percent resolved level one capable. I defined that metric for you earlier. It's the percentage of tickets resolved by desktop support that could have and should have been resolved at level one. This is a proxy for total cost of ownership, and I'm going to show you some data on that momentarily. Technician job satisfaction, why would that be on the short list? Well, it turns out that technician job satisfaction has a secondary effect on almost every other KPI in service and support. High levels of technician job satisfaction are correlated positively correlated with high levels of customer satisfaction, and they are inversely correlated with cost, turnover, and absenteeism, which means that as technician job satisfaction improves, costs go down, turnover goes down, and absenteeism goes down. So what's not to like about that metric? If you manage it effectively, and it can be managed, technician job satisfaction is a proxy for technician morale. 
and high levels of job satisfaction, hence high levels of morale, lead to lower costs, lower turnover, lower absenteeism, and higher customer satisfaction. And then finally, there's a balanced scorecard, which we just went through. These are the metrics that really matter. This is how you can effectively manage service and support. This is the whole idea behind the holistic approach to uh, key performance indicator or performance measurement and management within desktop support. Think of uh, the two dimensions or the two foundation metrics, cost and customer satisfaction, this way. When we put a series of data points on this two-dimensional chart with cost on the x-axis, quality on the y-axis, the white diamonds represent data points. We have lower cost on the right of the x-axis. We have higher cost high up on the x-axis. Where you want to be here is in the upper right-hand quadrant. This is where you have both low cost and high quality. That's kind of the holy grail of service and support is to be low cost and high quality. It means you've threaded the needle. It means that you've struck an appropriate balance between cost and quality and you've eliminated as much of the inefficiency as you possibly can. This is the quartile you want to operate in. If you're in this upper left hand quadrant, it says that your quality is good but your costs are high and what you need to do is reduce your costs over time. If you're in the lower right hand quadrant, your costs are low but so too is your quality and you need to move up the y-axis and improve your quality over time. If you're in the lower left quadrant, it's the worst of everything. You have high costs and you have low quality and over time you want to be moving up and to the right. Ultimately, it's this outer curve you want to get to. This is the curve where you are optimized. If you are optimized at this point, it says that you have a very, very high quality, but your costs are still below average. This vertical line here represents the average cost per ticket. The horizontal line bisecting the chart represents the average customer satisfaction. So at this point, you can be optimized at a high cost uh, or excuse me, a very high quality, but also a cost that's just a little bit below average. At this point here, you've erred on the side of low cost. You have very low cost, but you do have customer satisfaction that is above average. So this outer curve here represents the optimized curve. This is where you're trying to get to, some place on this curve where there's no more uh, inefficiency left in the system. You have optimized at this point when you end up on this curve. Now, one of the things we found as well amongst the best performing desktop support organizations is that they understood this relationship between the most important key performance indicators. Now, the red ones are the ones that show up on the short list. These are the 80-20 rule for desktop support. You can see we've got the foundation metrics at the top. I know that's a little bit counterintuitive. You think of foundation being at the bottom. But the reason we put the foundation metrics of cost per ticket and customer satisfaction, satisfaction at the top of the chart is because we wanted to show how every other KPI rolls into and flows up to cost and quality. Your big driver of cost is technician utilization. Your big driver of customer satisfaction is first contact resolution rate for incidents, and to a lesser extent, your service levels, meaning your mean times to resolve, as well as your technician job satisfaction. If you understand this cause and effect relationship, if you understand the linkage of the most important key performance indicators, puts a great deal of power into your hands because it shows you what levers you can pull to achieve desired outcomes. If you're trying to improve your cost per ticket, you can do so by making your technicians more efficient. Uh, that can happen in a couple of ways. You give them more work or you reduce headcount. Uh, your service levels, if they are too aggressive, that forces you into a high headcount position, that forces you into a high cost position. On customer satisfaction, improving your first contact resolution rate for incidents, reducing your mean times to resolve, and improving your technician satisfaction all have the effect of improving customer satisfaction. So this linkage is very powerful. If you understand the cause and effect relationship and the fact that anytime you move one KPI, all the others are going to move as well. Some of them not as much as others, but this linkage is very dynamic. You don't move a single metric and not see other metrics move. Uh, there is a cause and effect relationship that is shown here, hence the title, Desktop Support KPIs Cause and Effect. And it's under, important to understand this linkage, this interconnectedness between the most important key performance indicators in desktop support. Okay, we talked about uh, a holistic approach to performance measurement and management. I did skip over annual benchmarking, but I did allude to it earlier. Uh, I'm not going to go through all 10 of these because we are constrained by time. And the reason I skipped this one is because I've already mentioned it, the point being that the best performers in this benchmark were engaged in the habit of annually benchmarking their desktop support organizations. They also, that is the best performers, made significant investments in technician training. Now, technician training, whether it's level one support or desktop support, is kind of the motherhood and apple pie of service and support. Everybody 
talks about the importance of training and everybody claims that they're going to do a whole bunch of training, but I am convinced that if every organization in service and support did as much training as they claim they were going to do at the beginning of the year, every technician would get about five times more training than they actually get. But training is one of those things that is necessary but never urgent. And as we know in a service and support environment, uh, urgency takes priority over pretty much everything else. So what goes by the wayside? It's the things that are necessary but not urgent. Training is one of those things. It's almost never urgent, but it is necessary. So unfortunately, training hours get sacrificed on the altar of expediency. They get sacrificed for the sake of urgency. And most organizations end up doing about a fifth to a third of the actual training that they plan for. But here's why that's a mistake. Remember the cause and effect diagram I showed you just a couple slides back. Down near the bottom, in the right, we have a metric called training hours. Training hours have a strong impact on technician job satisfaction. Why do you care about that? Because technician job satisfaction has a strong impact on customer satisfaction. Training hours have a strong impact on work time and travel time, a strong impact on first contact resolution rate, and a strong impact on your service levels, your mean times to resolve. So training hours, although buried down here at the fourth level or the fifth level in this KPI diagram, training hours have a widespread ripple effect throughout the organization in as much as they drive technician job satisfaction and hence customer satisfaction, in as much as they affect work and travel time and hence cost per ticket, in as much as they increase and improve first contact resolution rate, which improves customer satisfaction, and in as much as they can help you reduce your service levels, which also reduces, or excuse me, improves your customer satisfaction. For your training hours, this is not just a motherhood and apple pie issue. Training hours have a real impact on an organization. If you don't believe me, here's the data. If we look at new technician training hours, x-axis, versus technician job satisfaction, y-axis, blue diamonds are data points, red line is linear regression. As the technician training hours improve, so too does technician job satisfaction. Why do we care about that? Because technician job satisfaction reduces absenteeism and turnover and improves customer satisfaction. What about annual technician training hours? As the number increases, once again, technician job satisfaction improves. Blue diamonds are data points. Red line is a linear regression through the data. These diamonds here on the y-axis, these are organizations that provide no ongoing training for their technicians. So they may provide some initial level of training, but they don't provide any ongoing level of training. But as you can see here, the more annual training the technicians get, the higher the technician job satisfaction goes. Once again, you care about that because technician job satisfaction has a secondary effect on cost through absenteeism and turnover and has a primary impact on customer satisfaction. This is why you care about training. This is why it's not just motherhood and apple pie. This is why it's good to follow through on your training plans. This is why it's good not to sacrifice training at the altar of expediency. Let's talk about total cost of ownership and first level resolution rate. Last year in North America, these are North American averages, the fully loaded cost of resolving a ticket at various levels in service and support is shown. At the service desk, the cost of resolution was about $22. At desktop support, the cost was about $62. Now, the reason this looks different from some of the data I showed earlier for the global desktop support benchmark is because this is North American data, and the global data I showed you earlier uh, was, in fact, global. It included a lot of very high-cost countries, countries like Singapore, Japan, uh, some of the Western European countries where the cost per ticket is higher than it is in North America, as well as some lower cost countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, India. But on balance, in the global benchmark, the cost of resolution at desktop support was higher than this. Uh, and it got much higher depending upon the density of the environment. You may recall for a field services or low density environment, the cost was almost $250 per ticket. But for this, uh, for the purposes of this, this is the data from North America from 2014. You can see the average cost of resolving a ticket at level one was about $22, $62 at desktop support or level two, and that's on top of the initial $22. So if you're running a SPOC, a single point of contact support organization, and you the ticket enters through the front end of the support organization, you're incurring $22, and then you're going to incur an additional $62 if that ticket gets dispatched to desktop support. Well, you can see here that obviously the lower on this totem pole, if you will, that you are able to resolve these tickets, the lower your total cost of ownership is going to be. 
Some of you have probably heard this referred to as shift left. In fact, if we look at the 22, the 62, the 85, they show up here. Here's the $22 at level one, the $62 at level two, the $85 at level three. Shift left simply means that you take a ticket and you move it to the left one or two or even three spots if you possibly can. If you can take a field support ticket at $196, and turn that into a service desk ticket at $22, you're saving about $175 per ticket for each one of those tickets. If you can take an end-level IT support ticket that you push out to, say, a NOC or a networking group or a data center or uh, an application development and maintenance group, you might be able to turn an $85 ticket into a $22 ticket. Uh, on average, a self-help ticket is about $2. Um, and it's not the labor associated with that. This is just the fixed cost, capitalized, and then amortized cost of creating the technology that enables a self-help portal. Uh, and by the way, some things are good for self-help, like password resets and other simple FAQs. For example, if you've just rolled out a new operating system uh, and there are a whole bunch of commonly asked questions, it's fine for a user to go to one of these self-help portals and get help. But what you don't want is a highly paid person within your company going to a self-help portal and spending a half hour or an hour or even two or three hours trying to solve their own problem when they could simply call service and support and get a quick resolution either at level one or potentially a quick resolution through desktop support. So not all shift left is good. Um, if you're pushing highly paid users into a self-help portal and they're spending more time trying to resolve their issues in self-help than they would spend uh, with, with a service desk or by uh, a ticket being dispatched to desktop support, then that is not a good thing. So self-help usually lends itself to simpler problems like Microsoft Office, FAQs, password resets, and the like. Uh, the best problem of all or the best incident of all, though, is the one that never occurs. Uh, level minus one is what we call it, and you can achieve this through root cause analysis, meaning you eliminate certain ticket types through root cause analysis. You can uh, do this through training. That is better end user training. The end users are better trained. They're more experienced, and as a result, they have uh, fewer tickets. And then just intelligent system design can oftentimes prevent incidents as well. So shift left is illustrated on this chart. Now, in order to make shift left work, you've got to, in, in order to make it work well, you really need a Spock single point of contact support organization. On this diagram here, we've got the user community out on the left, and then we've got the level one service desk as the Spock. And we've got end level support, including desktop support, which is level two, field support, which is level uh, three, I think, on our diagram. Uh, we've got uh, level two IT support, sometimes called level three support, and then we've got vendor support. Now, key SPOC principles are the following. The enterprise has got to view support as an end-to-end -end process. If you view this as independent silos, that is level one support is separate from desktop support, you're not going to be able to take advantage of the uh, total cost of ownership cost reduction possibilities that are possible and potential in a SPOC organization. Now, when you have a SPOC, as the name implies, single point of contact, the user has one place to go for all IT related incidents, questions, problems, and work requests. And the level one service desk should be the SPOC. This is not an organizational issue. It's not a turf battle. It's nothing like that. It simply makes the most sense to have level one operate as the SPOC, not to have desktop support or field support or the vendor or unless you're outsourced uh, or the vendor um, to be your single point of contact. So the level one service desk uh, should be the SPOC. They're responsible for triaging tickets, deciding where they get routed, resolving at level one if and when possible. They're not expected to resolve everything at level one, of course. Effective handoffs to end level support, resolve and coordinate, or, or excuse me, coordinate and facilitate resolution when possible, and then close tickets. Now, this doesn't mean that they have to close every single ticket, but it does mean they're responsible for making sure that tickets do get closed. So some of our clients even have what are called ticket chasers, not their full-time job, but what a ticket chaser does is they look at tickets that are nearing a service level breach, and they'll get in touch with the person who is currently holding that ticket or is currently responsible for that ticket, and they start prodding them. You know, this ticket uh, service level is going to expire in two hours or a half a day or whatever it might be. You've got to get going on it. How close are you? When are you going to close it? We don't want a service level breach. Now, also to make a SPOC work, uh, drive-bys, flybys, and snags are discouraged. Now, this is vernacular or lingo, if you will, jargon for desktop support. A drive-by is when there's a desktop support technician walking past your cube or your desk, and you grab the person and you say, hey, 
uh, I'm trying to turn rows into columns in Excel, or I'm trying to archive these old Outlook items. Can you help me do this? Well, the right answer is, yes, I can do it, but what you really need to do is call the service desk, and if it's appropriate to dispatch a, a desktop support technician, they will do that. And I realize in most organizations, if they are used, if the end users are used to having technicians around that they can just grab and pull in in a drive-by, fly-by, or snag to help them, it's very difficult to wean them off this process. However, if you want to minimize and reduce your total cost of ownership, if you want to honor the true SPOC model, single point of contact model, you have to enforce this discipline. You have to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Otherwise, what you're going to be doing is handling tickets at N level, that is desktop support, or some other level that could and should have been resolved uh, at level one. So these are some of the key principles to make SPOC work. Well, how do we know SPOC works? When we look at that metric that I've just told you about, percent resolved level one capable, and two sets of data, the, the blue diamonds are the percent resolved level one capable when there is a SPOC, the average is 15.3%. Keep in mind a low number is better because each one of these tickets that gets resolved at desktop support that could and should have been resolved at level one is a defect. It costs you a lot of money. The fuchsia colored squares, the average percent resolved level one capable is 22.8%. So we've got about a, a seven and a half or eight percentage point difference here between the percent resolved level one capable with and without a SPOC. So this is the data that backs up the notion that a single point of contact support organization helps reduce the total cost of ownership by reducing the number of tickets that are resolved that could that resolved by desktop support that could potentially have been resolved at level one in the organization. Let's talk about technology investments, specifically two types of invest investment. One would be remote control. These are, uh, you've heard the names of the tools. These are things like LogMeIn, GoToAssist, BombGuard, et cetera. Uh, knowledge management or KCS, Knowledge Centered Service. Um, but I want to define two metrics for you. The first one I've already defined, percent resolved level one capable, is a percentage of tickets resolved by desktop support that could have been resolved at level one. And first level resolution rate is the number of tickets resolved at level one divided by all tickets that can potentially be resolved at level one. Now, I'm always curious to know, and this brings us to our second set of polling questions for the day, I'm always curious to know which of these metrics are being tracked by those that come to our webcast. And so, this polling question asks, do you track first level resolution in your support organization? Are you tracking FLR, first level resolution? It's different than first contact. It simply means the percentage of tickets resolved at level one divided by all tickets that can potentially be resolved at level one. Are you tracking this metric? Okay, about 60% of you have weighed in on this. We'd like to get at least an 80 or 90% participation rate. We're already up to six, uh, 65, 70. Um, so weigh in on this if you can. Do you track first level resolution for your support organization? Okay, um, let me go ahead and uh, close that poll down and share the results with you. Uh, two thirds, 62%, almost two thirds. Uh, yes, you're tracking first level resolution rate, 27% of you know, and then 12% not applicable. This is a pretty good result. As recently as two years ago, the yes no's on this would have been reversed. Only about a fourth of those polled would have said yes, we're tracking first level resolution. Uh, and two-thirds would have said, no, we're not tracking first-level resolution. So this is a good trend. It's an indication that more and more support organizations understand that first-level resolution rate is, in fact, a proxy for total cost of ownership in service and support. Okay, let me open up the last polling question of the day, and that polling question also has to do with the metrics that I just talked about, and this time we're interested in knowing if you track percent resolved level one capable. Uh, this is a metric that not that many organizations do track, unfortunately. Um, and so we're always interested in knowing what percentage of those that attend our webcast actually track percent resolved level one capable. These are the tickets resolved by desktop support that could and should have been resolved by level one support. So please weigh in on this. About half of you have weighed in so far. We'd like to get that number up to around 80 or 90 percent. Do you track percent resolved level one capable within your support organization? Okay, let me go ahead and close that poll and share those results with you. About a third, roughly 30%, uh, are in fact tracking that metric. That's the best result we've ever seen. That's a pretty good result. Two-thirds or 65% are not tracking 
that metric. For those that are not tracking it, I would urge you to start thinking about it, start thinking about how you track it. It could be as simple as putting a checkbox on the trouble ticket so that when desktop support closes a ticket, they can check a box that says this was level one resolvable. Now, in order to make that work, there has to be a sort of an auditing QA check. Once a month, you pick a random set of tickets and you look at the ones that have been designated as resolvable at level one to ascertain that they really were resolvable at level one. And you also pick uh, a random sampling of tickets that were not designated as resolvable at level one to see how many of them could actually have been resolved at level one. So there is a relatively straightforward way to track this metric percent resolved level one capable. Don't let the fancy name scare you, but it's an important metric because it is a proxy for total cost of ownership and service and support. Okay, I'm going to close that poll down and we're going to continue on in our uh, discussion of what the best performers in our desktop support benchmark had in common with each other. Here's the technology that I alluded to earlier. In this particular case, we're looking at remote control software. Um, these would be tools like BombGuard, GoToAssist, and LogMeIn. And you can see that with remote diagnostic software, the Blue Diamonds, the average first level resolution rate was almost 78%. When there is no remote diagnostic software, the average first level resolution rate was only 61%. So we have about a 16 and a half percentage point difference between those with and without a remote diagnostic tool when you look at first level resolution rate. Well, why do we care about this? Well, because if your first level resolution rate is low, there's a pretty good chance that your percent resolved level one capable is going to be high. And we know that those are defects. We know that those tickets that get resolved at desktop support that couldn't should have been resolved at level one cost the organization quite a bit of money. And so this is not uh, permission or sort of carte blanche to go out there and purchase one of these tools. Uh, clearly any investment you make in technology has to be subjected to a business case analysis. But what I am showing is that for the organizations in our benchmarking database, those with remote diagnostic software had a much higher first level resolution rate on average than those that did not have remote diagnostic software. Now when we look at the maturity of the knowledge base on a scale of one to five, five being most mature, one being least mature, you can see the blue diamonds here categorized by the maturity of the knowledge base. We put them in discrete categories. You're either one, two, three, four, or five. We didn't allow partial scores like four and a half or three and a half. Run the linear regression through that, the red line, and you can see that the first level resolution rate increases as the knowledge base maturity improves. So as your maturity in KCS, knowledge-centered service, increases, so too does your net first level resolution rate. So here are two examples of technologies from the benchmark that can improve both your first level or reduce your percent resolved level one capable and improve your first level resolution rate. One being remote diagnostic software or remote control software as it's sometimes called and the other one being the maturity of your knowledge management system or your knowledge base. Now I've skipped over process optimization because it's a huge topic. There's no way to do it you know, in one or, one or two or three or four or five minutes. Uh, you're all aware, though, of the mega trend of idle that is operating within an idle framework and IT service management tools. You're all, all familiar with that. Um, due to time constraints here, we're not going to be able to dive into that. So I'm jumping over that one and going right to this idea of driving accountability down to the individual technician level. This was something that we weren't necessarily expecting to see. We kind of suspected that this might be the case, but it was such a prominent factor, it was such a prominent practice amongst the best performers in this benchmark that we included it in the top 10. Um, here's essentially what it means, is that the scorecard that is used to measure the overall desktop support performance can be repurposed to create a scorecard for individual technicians. Now, not everybody did it exactly the same way, but the concept was the same amongst those organizations that were driving uh, accountability down to the individual technician level. Once again, we've got eight metrics that make up the scorecard. Mechanically, this scorecard works exactly like the overall desktop support scorecard that I shared with you earlier. The metrics, however, are slightly different because these are individual metrics. What you're doing here is creating a scorecard monthly or quarterly for each individual technician that works in desktop support. You weight each metric according to its relative importance. Of course, those metrics add to 100%. You can see that we have some soft metrics in here or some, or some subjective metrics like teamwork and initiative and mentoring. Well, even though those are subjective, 
you can quantify those. You can put them on a scale of zero to five, and you can come up with your judgment as a supervisor or a manager or a team lead and give each person that works in the organization a score on a scale of one to five on those softer or subjective metrics. But again, mechanically, this works exactly like the balanced scorecard that I showed you earlier for the overall service desk. This is simply applied to individual technicians. Moreover, most of our clients now will actually post the results on a monthly basis. Now, you don't want to embarrass anybody, so you don't put any last names in this left-hand column here, but every technician knows what their designation is, and they can see how they are performing relative to the others in desktop support. If they're constantly struggling and can't seem to break out of the bottom quartile, well, maybe they need to think about whether or not they're in the right position. Self-attrition is not a bad thing. When an individual decides that they're in a job that just isn't right for them and they choose to move on either within the company or to another job in another organization, that is not necessarily a bad thing. But this is what these performance rankings do, is they help everyone in the organization understand how they're performing. They provide a trend in performance. They provide an incentive to improve performance. And for those that are persistently not performing well, Sometimes they self-attrit out. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But this objectifies the process of delivering feedback to individual technicians that work in service and support. We've all been on both the giving end and the receiving end of formal performance reviews. And we know that even when you get a, a positive performance review or deliver a positive performance review, there's something that is not quite satisfying about giving or receiving that review because they tend to be so subjective along the lines of, hey, you're doing a pretty good, good job here. You could put a little bit more effort into X, Y, Z. It's, it's a lot of, um, you know, it tends to be pretty, pretty mushy. And I think what individual technicians want and deserve is uh, candid feedback and objective feedback and quantifiable feedback, and that's what this individual technician scorecard does for you. You can go right down this list, second column from the right, and see where this technician is doing very well. They're doing a great job with taking initiative. They're doing a great job with mentoring some of the newer technicians that work in the organization. They're not doing as well on the number of service requests closed per month, so their productivity is a little bit below average there. But by and large, this person is doing reasonably well when you look at these metric scores. When you look at the overall score, 43.7%, it's not a great score. But what this does is it enables a supervisor or a team lead or a manager to deliver very candid feedback to the individual technicians, very quantifiable feedback, very specific feedback about how that technician can improve his or her performance over time. Let's talk about marketing service and support. Now, marketing is a little bit of a misnomer because what we're really talking about here is managing your message internally. Now, let me introduce for you a concept of actual value versus perceived value in service and support. Now, you can measure your actual value in service and support by doing a benchmark. So we've got higher value on the right, lower value on the left. We're actually measuring it using a benchmark. But the actual value is different than the perceived value. I'm talking about the perception of other stakeholders that work in the organization. That perception might be high, it might be lower, it might be somewhere in between. But the only locus of points that makes any sense here is the diagonal. This is where the perceived value is the same as the actual value. So if your actual value is low and the perception is low, well, at least it's a fair perception. If your actual value is high according to the benchmark and the perception is high, well, again, perception and reality are the same. So that's the only locus of points that makes any sense is this diagonal line where the perceived value is equal to the actual value. But that almost never happens. More often than not, uh, most support organizations end up in the lower right-hand corner here. And I've painted this red for a reason. Red means danger, green means good. Um, I've never in my career, and I've been doing this for a while, seen a service and support organization operate up here, meaning that the perception of what they're doing is better than what they're actually doing. That just doesn't happen. What does happen quite frequently is that you're operating down here, meaning that you're delivering good value by any objective measure. However, you're not getting credit for it, and the perception is that you're not delivering very good value. Well, why do I say that this is a dangerous position? It's common, but it's dangerous. Well, because decisions are based on perception not reality. And if the perception is incorrect, 
bad decisions can be made. It might be a bad decision not to provide additional funding, not to approve a technology project, not to approve additional headcount. It might be a bad decision to insource or outsource, and I'm neutral on that issue. I'm neither pro nor con when it comes to insourcing and outsourcing. But the point is that when perception and reality diverge, when the perceived value and the actual value are not the same, decisions are oftentimes made that are not that they're bad decisions because the perception is not equal to the reality. And so you need to do something about this. That is, you need to think about how you close that gap. Now, we're not talking here, you've probably heard the expression, put lipstick on the pig. What we're not talking about here is taking a weak performing desktop support organization and make it look really good. That's not it at all. In fact, the vast majority of this presentation today has talked about operational effectiveness. That is, how do you improve your performance? But there's a second piece that is equally important, which is how do you manage your brand and how do you make sure that this gap doesn't open up between perception and reality? And so what we want to talk about is how to close this perception gap. Pretty straightforward. MetricNet has put together a five-part model. It actually, we've got a two-hour presentation on this, but today I'm going to give you the two-minute version. The five W's in the model are who, who are the key stakeholders, what are the key messages you need to communicate, when and how often do you communicate them? What are the key channels you use to reach those stakeholders? And then why are we doing this? A little bit of a rhetorical question, but there's a bit of a punchline towards the end here. The success factors in terms of timing is frequent as possible. At new employee orientation, let the new employees know what service and support is all about. Login messages that let uh, knowledge workers in the organization know how they can reach service and support. During training, I'm not talking about service and support training. I'm talking about any IT-related training. There should be a module on support, desktop support and level one support. When an incident or a service request is open, uh, that's an opportunity to communicate with end users or other stakeholders and at scheduled sessions. Much like what I'm doing right now, many of our clients have started doing weekly or monthly webcasts for their end users so that they can help them understand what services are offered by service and support. Now, what about messages? Well, the more communication, the better. Let the end users and other stakeholders know what services you offer, what key initiatives are underway. Perhaps you're um, upgrading your, uh, your uh, instance of Symantec. Perhaps you're customizing that. Perhaps you are improving um, your, uh, your, your processes. Perhaps your customer satisfaction survey just went out and you want end users to know about that. Let them know what your performance is, the good, the bad, and the ugly. What are some FAQs that they can access online? And what are some success stories that you want to communicate to those end users? What we found is that simply communicating more effectively with end users goes a long ways towards improving their customer satisfaction. Now, what channels are you going to use to communicate this? Well, anything available. User liaisons. These are individuals that work within the organization. They might be in sales or human resources or finance or payroll or accounting that agree to act as the eyes and the ears of service and support. So they act as your messenger to end users and other key stakeholders. They tell you what their stakeholders are thinking, and you are able to get messages back to those stakeholders through those user liaisons. If you don't have a newsletter that goes out quarterly, think about doing that. Reference guides online, customer sat surveys, and login messages that let the end user know everything from where, where they can find the service catalog to what your hours of operation are. Now, the obvious question, why are we doing all this? Well, because we've heard this expression before that expectations not set are expectations not met. And running a world-class service and support organization is nothing if not managing expectations. And so you've got to be serious about how you manage these expectations. Now, a client of mine sent me this comic more than a dozen years ago, and it reads, delight customers, why can't we just satisfy them like we used to? And the reason that that is not acceptable is because satisfied customers are not, you have to be satisfied to be delighted or to be an enthusiastic customer, but being just satisfied is not good enough anymore. A satisfied customer is not necessarily a loyal customer. They are not necessarily going to propagate positive word of mouth referrals about uh, service and support. And so customer satisfaction is no longer a worthy goal. What you're looking for are customer delight or customer enthusiasm. That is what you're after here. And the only way to achieve that and close the gap between perception and reality is, in fact, to get a proactive message out there and make sure that key stakeholders, not just end users, but other stakeholders within the, or other, within the organization have gotten these messages that are outlined here on page 57. If I were to summarize, you know, what we learned about marketing from the best performers in this benchmark is that they 
understand that managing this gap is pretty straightforward. It doesn't take a lot of time and it doesn't cost a lot of money, but it is as important to manage the perception of what you're doing as it is to manage your actual performance. Again, it doesn't cost a lot of money or time, but it is at least as important as your actual performance. The benefits of doing this are improved customer loyalty, positive word of mouth referrals, credibility. The more credible you are, the more you can get done. It's a lot easier to get headcount approved, projects approved, budget approved, when you've got real credibility in the organization. It helps drive a positive image for IT overall, and I'm going to show you that momentarily, and it helps to drive high levels of customer satisfaction. Now, the last mega trend that we observed from the best performers in this global desktop support benchmark is the idea that they treat service and support as a business. I'm not talking about an outsourcing business. What I'm talking about is that when they're managing this internal function, level one support and or desktop support, they act and they think like business people. Let me explain that. And I'm gonna start with something called the paradox of IT service and support. And the paradox is this, only about 4% of all IT spending is dedicated to service and support. The other 96% is spent on things like application development and maintenance, network operations, mainframe and mid-range computing, and contracted services like disaster recovery. Now, because it's only a 4% line item on a much bigger budget, many in leadership in IT, CTOs, CIOs, and others, assume that there's not much upside here. I mean, after all, what can you do with a function that represents only 4% of your total spending? The result is that uh, service and support tends to be managed as a cost center. And cost centers uh, are viewed as keep the lights on functions, uh, we even, even had clients tell us that service and support is a necessary evil, meaning that we put it out there to protect our IT people from those pesky end users. You know, so it's almost viewed, service and support is viewed as a barrier to protect the rest of IT. Um, this unfortunately is very wrong-headed thinking because the most successful service and support organizations, the most effective view service and support as a, a value uh, they manage it as a value activity. You're not going to be creating a profit here, but you can manage it not as a cost center, but as a value center where you focus on driving the greatest value possible. Now, how do you do that? One way you do that is by minimizing total cost of ownership through shift left strategies. If you can turn a level two ticket into a level one ticket, you can reduce total cost of ownership. If you can turn a vendor ticket into a level one ticket, you save even more money. If you can turn a, an end level IT ticket into a desktop ticket or a level one ticket, again, you save money. This is one way you create value in service and support, and it's one way you create a positive ROI in service and support. Another key, uh, source of economic value in service and support is that you make end users more productive. Now this uh, chart looks fairly complicated, uh, but it's really not that complicated. Let me explain what we've got here. There were 60 companies that participated in this particular research. We did a service desk and a desktop support benchmark for each of those 60 companies. And then based on their performance, we organized them into quartiles. The best performers, top 15, were in the first quartile. The second best performers, uh, next 15 were in the second quartile, next group of 15 were in the third quartile, and then the poorest performers were in the fourth quartile. Now we also did an industrial engineering time and motion study, and we selected a cross-section of end users from within each of these 60 organizations, and we asked them over the course of a month to keep track of how much productive time they lost as a result of IT-related problems and issues. Now, your average end user has more than three devices now. If you take their phones, their, their tablets, their laptop computers, their desktop computers, some of our clients even have servers and printers in their offices. When those devices don't work the way they're supposed to, productivity is impeded. Doesn't necessarily mean that the user is out of business. Sometimes it does mean that. If you've got a salesperson and their hard drive crashes, they may not be able to work until they get a new hard drive or a new computer. But in most cases, you just have an impediment to productivity. So we realize that there's some estimation that goes into these numbers. Nevertheless, here's what we learned, is that if you're lucky enough to work in an organization that has top quartile service and support, down here, top quartile, you're still gonna lose an average of 17 productive hours per end user per year. By contrast, if you are unlucky enough to work in an organization that has fourth quartile service and support, you're gonna lose about 47 productive hours per year. Think about that. The difference between a top quartile performer and a bottom quartile performer is a stunning 30 hours per year per person. Multiply that 30 hours 
by the tens or hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people that work in a large organization and you can start to see that service and support provides real economic value to an organization. In North America last year, the average fully loaded cost of an employee was over $80,000 if you add up their salaries, all of their benefits, uh, more than $80,000 per employee. So you can impute, if you're, if you're giving back 30 productive hours per year to each employee, that's almost a full week. And you can multiply those 30 hours by the number of employees you've got, multiply it by that roughly $80,000. It's more in some industries, it's less in some other industries, but you can actually impute an economic value that is derived from and delivered by service and support based upon which quartile you operate in. And this is by far the biggest contributor to the economics of, of, of the contribution made by service and support to the economics of the organization. And this is why it is not uncommon for service and support to have an ROI of 400, 500, 600 percent in many cases because they are able to return productive hours to the end user and they are able to reduce total cost of ownership through shift left in such a way that they produce value far in excess of what is spent. So if you have a service and support organization that you're spending $2 million a year on and through shift left technologies as well as returning productive hours to end users, you create uh, $6 million in value, you've got a 300 percent ROI because your return is six million dollars, your spend was two million dollars, you got a 300 percent return on investment. It's important to understand how value is created in this environment. And finally, I've alluded to this a couple of times, I want to show you some data from more than a thousand organizations that participated in a benchmark or a uh, survey that MetricNet did a few years back. We asked these organizations, we knew that all of them ran an annual IT customer satisfaction survey. We contacted them and we asked them if we could include one of our questions in their survey. That question asked the end user simply, what drives your perception of corporate IT? Here was a stunning conclusion. 84% of the respondents said that the service desk had a significant impact on their view of corporate IT. Another 47% said desktop support had a significant impact on their view of corporate IT. And when you add these up, you get more than 100% um, because it was a multiple choice survey and we gave each individual a chance to answer three, you know, what are your top three choices here. And the conclusion was that service and support have the biggest impact on customer satisfaction in IT, more so than pretty much anything else. Now this makes sense if you think about it because end users don't have a whole lot of contact with the network group, with the NOC, for example, with mainframe computing, with application development and maintenance, but they do have frequent contact with service and support. Your average end user has contact with the service desk a couple times a month. On average, 24 tickets a year, two tickets a month. Desktop support, on average, has contact uh, with an end user every other month. So about six tickets per year at desktop support, 24 tickets per year for the service desk. So about 30 contacts per year. That's one uh, about every other week or one every week and a half, uh, an end user is contacting uh, end user support. And this is why it has such a profound impact on what end users think of all of IT. So even though this represents only 4% of total spending, it has a disproportionate influence on what end users think of all of IT. There's an expression in this industry which is, as service and support goes, so too goes all of IT. And this is the data that proves that. This is a proxy for the effectiveness of IT within the organization. Those who work in service and support are the gateway to IT for the vast majority of end users. And that gives you a special opportunity as well as a special responsibility. The opportunity is to drive a positive view of corporate IT and the responsibility, well, it's the same thing, to drive a positive view of corporate IT. But for a CIO or anybody in leadership within an organization, this kind of data should be a wake-up call that says service and support is not a cost center, it's not a cost to be minimized, it's not a keep the lights on function, it's not a necessary evil, it's an opportunity to make all of IT look good, it's an opportunity to create value by returning productive hours to end users, it's an opportunity to create value through shift left strategies, and so you might want to pay attention to this. Our recommendation to CIOs is Spend an hour a week with service and support. If you can't get down there physically, at least call them once a week and talk to them and find out what they need and make sure that they know that you are accessible and that they can get the resources they need, not just dollars and, and headcount and technology, but that they have your ear. That is, they have your time, personal time and attention. 
because that makes all the difference in the world. Engaged CIOs, CTOs, and leadership in IT services in IT, when they are engaged with service and support, we get much higher customer satisfaction results. So let me summarize what we learned from Benchmark 2014. We learned that desktop support is now being managed much more as a strategic asset than it has been historically. It's no longer viewed as just a support function. It's a strategic asset that can reduce the overall cost of IT through shift left strategies and returning productive hours to end users, make end users more productive and drive a positive view of IT. I've just been through that set of slides. World-class desktop support organizations have a number of success factors in common. They view desktop support as part of an end-to-end -end process. They understand the economics of TCO. And as a result, they have act active efforts to maximize FCR, first contact resolution rate, and first level resolution rate. They use KPIs both diagnostically and prescriptively. They invest in technician training, coaching, and career pathing, realizing that it helps drive higher levels of customer satisfaction. They actively manage their internal messaging, and they aggressively promote and communicate the ROI, the value delivered by desktop support. Now in a minute, I'm going to get to the questions that are queued up, that have been typed into the dialog box, and conduct a Q&A session. Uh, hopefully, my computer will stay on. Uh, there's a thunderstorm going on here in Washington, D.C., and uh, we have been known to lose power on occasion, so I'm hoping that uh, I can go for another several minutes here and answer all of the questions that you have. But before I get to that Q&A, uh, let me just um, tell you that there are a number of things that you can do almost immediately to leverage some of the insights that you have, may have gained here today. Um, the first thing is that I want to encourage all of you to take a look around our website at metricnet.com. Uh, one of the unique features of the website is that we do offer a free premium membership that gives you unlimited access to all of our online content. I'd also suggest that you connect with us on social media where we put out a steady stream of information on IT that service and support professionals may find useful. Now in the copy of the presentation itself, I've provided you with all the links so that you can join our social media pages and groups. Uh, don't forget to register for our upcoming webcast. Later this month, we're going to be doing a webcast on call center KPIs. We're also doing a webcast on the role of IT leadership in service and support. You can sign up on our website. Next month, we're going to be doing a webcast on service desk best practices. And in September, uh, we're going to be doing what's called a benchmark roundup, where we summarize uh, the results to date of the 2015 service and support benchmarks that we have completed. And then in October, uh, we've got a, a very popular webcast called the Zen of Support. I want to encourage you to sign up for those. They're always free of charge. Uh, please also feel free to browse through our resource library on MetricNet's website where you'll find a uh, number of white papers, presentations, and magazine articles on service and support benchmarking and uh, industries, industry best practices. And for those who are interested in benchmarking, we offer three different alternatives depending on the level of granularity you need in your benchmarking data and uh, your budgetary constraints. Uh, and for those that are interested in a continuous improvement initiative, MetricNet offers the one-year path to world-class performance. Now you can reach MetricNet at this phone number in the United States, 703-992-7559. Uh, you can also find forms to fill out if you want to contact us on our website at metricnet.com. Or you can send us an email at info at metricnet.com. Now for those who have time to stay on for a few more minutes, I will be answering any questions that you typed in during the webcast. And uh, for those who must exit the webcast at this time, uh, I want to thank you for attending the session. I do hope you found it to be informative and insightful. Please don't forget to complete the brief survey that pops up when you exit the webcast. Uh, this is a requirement if you wish to receive a copy of today's presentation. So thank you once again. Let's take a look at the questions we have. Okay. okay. First question comes from John. Uh, how do you calculate absenteeism was John's question. Um, absenteeism is unplanned absenteeism. So in other words, uh, vacations, uh, doctor's visits, holidays do not count towards absenteeism. So if you're expecting a person to come in on a particular day and they don't come in, uh, that's considered uh, absenteeism that we use in the absenteeism rate. Now, if uh, a person let's say that the average person misses one day out of 10. So every two weeks they miss a day of work unexpectedly. That's going to be 10% absenteeism because they're out one day out of 10. 
Uh, if by contrast they're out one day per month, that's uh, 12 days per year, and that's a much lower absenteeism rate. That's about a 3 or 4 percent absenteeism rate. So absenteeism is unscheduled absenteeism. You look at the average number of absentees per day or per month or per year. Generally, you're going to be looking at it on a monthly or yearly basis. Okay. Um, next question is from uh, Gabriel. And the question is, we struggle with determining technician utilization as a valid benchmark because our technicians are not accurately entering their total time spent on each ticket they work. Is there a better way to get the technician utilization benchmark other than having the technicians manually entering time worked in individual tickets? Um, Gabriel, what you're doing is the right thing, which is asking your technicians to report uh, the time that they work on, on tickets. Um, you probably also want to ask them to report their travel time because travel time should count towards their utilization. So both travel time and work time should count towards their utilization. We realize that these are only estimates unless they are actually empowered with a handheld app, which uh, are available now. Uh, there are apps that you can download that enable your technicians to put themselves in different work modes. So they can be in travel mode, they can be in repair mode, they can be in uh, service request mode, they can be in incident mode, they can be in idle mode, that is they're waiting for tickets and there are none, which doesn't happen very often. They might be in lunch mode, they might be in break mode, they might be in holiday mode. mode. But what happens is this data gets continuously or daily uploaded to the cloud and then you can look at daily, weekly, monthly numbers that show what your work time per service request, your work time per incident, and your travel time per service request, and your travel time uh, per incident are. That is probably the best way to do that. In fact, you see this technology all the time with the delivery drivers from FedEx and UPS. When they drop a package off, you'll see themselves push a button on their handheld device, which puts them into a different work mode. They're either in delivery mode or they're drive mode, they're load mode, unload mode, uh, they're, they're in lunch mode, they're in break mode. Um, this is not new technology, but it is starting to gain traction within desktop support organizations who are serious about tracking their work time per ticket and travel time per ticket. Okay, a question from George. How do you split financials between incidents and service requests in order to get cost per ticket? Do you just take total cost and split proportionally based on ticket number proportions? Um, the answer is no. Um, to get cost per ticket, we take total cost and divide it by total ticket volume. So let's say that you uh, your annual cost is a million dollars and you handle uh, 5,000 tickets per year. Okay, that ends up being about $200 per ticket. So that, that's the gross calculation is just monthly cost divided by monthly ticket volume or yearly cost divided by yearly ticket volume. That's how you can get your cost per ticket. Now to get to cost per service request and cost per incident, you have to know your work and travel time per service request and your work and travel time for incidents. So let's just say that we take the total number of incidents in a month and we multiply that by the work plus travel time for an incident. So you get your total incident workload for the month. And then we take our service request volume for the month and we multiply that by the service request travel time and work time for the month and you get your service request workload. So we now have two workloads, one for incidents, one for service requests. Let's just say that we have 40,000 minutes of incident work, um, workload and 60,000 minutes of service request workload. So we've got a 40% of our work is done on incident, 60% is done on service request. You would take the monthly budget, let's say it's a million dollars, 400,000 of that would be for incidents, 600,000 of that would be for service requests. So you actually have to break it down um, or break the workload down by incidents and service requests. And again, your incident workload would be your incident volume time your, times your incident uh, work time plus travel time and your service request work volume would be your in service request volume multiplied by the service request work time plus travel time. So that's how you get to that metric. A question here uh, again from George, does side techs in my organization perform both remote access tickets and tickets that require physical touch? Is this type of organization typical and all tech work included in benchmark metrics or is this true desk side work segregated for comparison? Um, what we try to do, George, in, in this particular study is separate out just desk side or desktop work because when you're doing something remotely, it's not really desktop support. I, I, I know there's a common term in the industry called you know remote desktop support. In my opinion, it's a complete oxymoron because if you're remote, you're not doing desktop support. In our definition at MetricNet, desktop or desk side support means that you are physically present at the site of the device or the user. If you're doing something remotely, which is not a bad way to start a ticket to see if it can be resolved remotely, you're not really resolving it desk side or desktop. 
So in this particular benchmark, we were careful to make sure that organizations included only tickets that were delivered or that, that were worked on desk side or at the site of the device. That was our intent, was to look at pure desk side, pure desktop support as opposed to the remote tickets that are sometimes resolved by desktop support. The real question is, if you've got desktop support te uh, the technicians doing stuff remotely, why isn't that being done at level one? It should be done at level one because uh, desktop support technicians make a whole lot more money, not a whole lot more, but they typically make about 20% more than level one technicians. So if at all possible, you want your desktop support, uh, you want your level one technicians to be resolving things remotely, not your desktop support technicians. Okay, a question from Monty. Who are those data points in the top uh, quartile from slide 30 who should all aspire to be? Um, page 30. Um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll go to that page, but I, what I can't do is give you a bunch of names because we, we sign non-disclosure agreements with all these organizations, and what we can't do is um, give out their names. So here's the, the slide that Monty's talking about, who are those that are in this upper right-hand quadrant here. Um, again, we, we sign non-disclosure agreements with all of our clients, so we can't disclose their, their, their names. However, um, there's no mystery about how you get there. We try to... Uh, as much as possible in a 90-minute webcast, talk about how you get into that upper right-hand quadrant where you are both efficient and uh, effective. Um, but um, uh, getting there, um, if you follow the industry best practices, and we, we outline 10 of them in this benchmark, and then we've shown, shown you what the benchmarks look like, if you follow those 10 best practices that we went through, you will end up in that upper right-hand quadrant on that cost versus quality sheet. Um, okay, that was the last of the questions. If you have any questions that you'd like answered, please type them in right now. I'll wait another few seconds here just in case somebody has a question that they would like to ask or a question that hasn't been answered so far. Uh, feel, free to, uh, feel free to type that question in. Okay, uh, it looks like uh, there are no more questions, so we're going to conclude our webcast. I want to thank you once again uh, for those of you that did stay on until the very end here. We realize these webcasts are long, but uh, we try and add as much content and as much provide as much valuable content as we possibly can. Uh, please remember to complete the brief survey that pops up when you exit the webcast because this is a requirement if you wish to receive a copy of today's presentation. Once again, thank you so much for attending our webcast. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you feel that uh, you learned something today. Thank you very much. Good day to all of you. Bye now.